Hey everybody, here's a follow-up interview with Marcus, the creator of the Open Source Scan Converter. I first interviewed him about a year and a half ago when the OSSC project was first announced, uh, and there's been a ton of updates from then till now, so I really wanted to get him back on to talk about that, and just because I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, he's got a bunch of really awesome projects out there and some things that I think are going to be a really big help to the retro gaming community. So uh, here you go, an interview with Marcus. Hey everybody, I'm happy to be back with Marcus uh, for the second interview. How are you doing, Marcus? Uh, I'm fine, thanks. Thanks very much for coming back on and doing this again, and uh, I'm very glad I got the time zone right this time. <laughs> um, so, there's been a lot of updates since the last time we spoke. Uh, you've been working on some pretty incredible projects, but I think um, it would be fair to start with the, the original project that you came up with that drew so much attention and has now become, in my opinion, uh, the standard in classic gaming on modern TVs, the open source scan converter. So um, I guess the latest version as of this is uh, firmware version 0.81, uh, and that introduces a, a ton of new features. So would you be able to just kind of walk us through a little bit what's happened in the past year and a half, I think, since the last time I spoke to you? and how you're able to implement so many of these cool features? Uh, well, let me start with the point eight one. So basically that has a couple of categories of these updates. So first one is the actual scanline improvements and those were mainly implemented by Borti and Paul B and I just mainly integrated them inside. And then there also was some usability improvements uh, like the dual way profile linking and the LCD backlight timeout. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, some fixes related to masking and stuff like that. You know, it's funny, the, the little things sometimes that I would have never thought of make a big difference. And the LCD timeout's one of them. Because uh, I would have never thought to ask for that as a feature, but when I'm playing in a dark room, um, you know, you want to be able to see the LCD as you're actually tuning the OSSC and, and changing the settings. But once I'm kind of sucked into a game, it is very cool that that goes off automatically now. So, it's you know, I tend to get very excited about the big features and sometimes overlook the little ones until I'm actually using them. But it's very cool that uh, you're kind of covering both grounds on this. Yeah, I planned to implement it much earlier, but I was just too lazy to <laughs> make it like. I so certainly wouldn't I, I know anything you've been doing lazy, though. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm just looking right now at the firmware change log, and there's a ton of stuff. Um, I think the thing that shocked me the most was in version 076, when you're able to implement 5x uh, scaling. Um, that's just incredible, because this originally started out as essentially a 720p line tripler. Um, how hard was it to actually get uh, 5x scaling? Well, there's some, like, on the hardware level, the FPGA is, like... It can barely uh, reach that pixel block, so you have to optimize a few things, and then of course there's this uh, clock multiplication issues and things like that. And I was worried about the PCB layout also, that is it like good enough for such high, high signals, high rate signals, but it turned out pretty well, so I'm quite happy with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, the other thing that I noticed was um, uh, hybrid scan lines. So how did those get implemented? And, and can you talk a little bit about what a hybrid scan line is for people that might not know? Uh, the hybrid is basically like your scan line intensity depends on the actual pixel value. So it's kind of how it blends. And I'm probably not the best person to explain it, but basically uh, you don't have like how to looks, so it's like maybe a bit more natural when you use the hybrid method. Um, so one of the things that I've always wondered, and I know this is kind of skipping ahead and looking to the future, but when there's eventually a 4K and then of course an 8K or a 100K, whatever the future brings for us, um, the more resolution you have, the more you're able to dial in each, uh, each pixel of the original console. So having vertical scan lines as well to mimic the look of the old arcade monitors and then even a Sony BVM CRT with a you know a very high line count monitor. Um, is, 
And have you tried doing that at all with uh, 5x scaling or basically 1080p? Um, and with hybrid scan lines, are you, um, is that going to make it easier or harder to mimic the original look? Uh, you mean like uh, combining both the horizontal and vertical? Mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, I think that's like separate from the hybrid thing, but yeah, certainly I've thought about combining those and it would give you the real type of look. So yeah, that's something to consider when we, when we make like further scan line improvements. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I just, I don't want to go through each individual update because, uh, you know, it'd be a very long video, but, um, so I just wanted to touch upon some of the features that I thought were pretty incredible. Uh, of course, now you in integrated audio inside it as well. So you have an analog to digital audio converter. That yeah, I think the, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that audio and, uh, higher line multiplication are those biggest ones during this one and a half years. So. How about it? How, how long is it since our, our last interview? Mm -hmm. um, I've I've had very good luck with that as uh, as well. So I mean I haven't had any issues with the audio side coming out. So that's uh, it was done very well. Um, and the uh, the do it yourself latency tester. Uh, I actually haven't had time to test that feature. But would you be able to talk a little bit about how that works? Uh, yeah, actually, I got the idea like a long time ago, and I. Also made a uh, do-it-yourself latency tester with, with just a MCU, like something like five, six years ago. And while it worked quite okay, it's like, it's much harder to set up and use compared to this FPGA implementation where you actually generate the patterns. So here it was just, you hook up the sensor and just generate the patterns and calculate the latency. So quite simple. Hmm. That's definitely something I want to work on and uh, I want to use because latency testing, display latency testing is something that's obviously a very big deal for classic gamers who are used to, you know, what, what we call zero latency on a CRT. Um, so that's a very, a very cool feature that I never would have expected. Um, do you have anything else uh, on the table for the open source scan converter in the short term or I guess in the long term? Uh, in its current form, so not not a different model, but this you know this current open source scan converter as we know it now. Uh, well, the one big thing is that we are looking that is like replacing the current soft CPU. So the NIOS two is like it's quite easy to uh, set up, but it's quite lacking in features. And if you want some advanced stuff, you have to pay the licenses. So I'm now looking for alternatives for that. Okay. What other features would a, a different CPU allow? Um, it's mainly about this, how much you can compress the actual code and things like that. Oh, okay. Um, now, the one feature, uh, and please don't, <laughs> don't take this as a complaint because I'm a huge fan and I, I love the open source scan converter, but the one feature I was really hoping to see at some point um, was being able to load profiles onto the micro SD card so that you could post profiles for consoles online. Um, is that something that's even feasible in the, um, with the way it's currently working, or is the FPGA just completely filled up with all the other features? Uh, well, that comes also to the CPU replacement issue. So basically, you have lots of flash on the board, and also well, that can be used for many things, but with the SD card, and profiles, the main problem is that if you want to make them like usable between different firmwares, so basically you need to validate every profile and then also parse them if you want to use plain text. Mm. Uh, and when you think about what you have to do on the FPC or on the soft CPU, then I think those validators and parsers and maybe also some file systems so people just can do it put the card on the PCs and write it normally, not, not like as a disk image. So basically those, I need quite a lot of code space. And for the code space pro problem, you really need the new soft CPU subsystem. Okay. For the, uh, for the short term though, I know there's uh, some people, myself included, have trouble getting Neo Geo working without uh, tweaking the settings a little bit. And I'm just using one example, of course, but you know, other people say they plugged their AES in, it works right off the bat. Um, I plugged mine in and I needed to change the settings that are shown up on the, 
the wiki right now. Yeah, if uh, if we we as the community find certain profile settings that are you know extremely helpful, is that something we could submit on the wiki and to be included in a future firmware? Because obviously you just explained that it wouldn't be something that we could do and just throw on the SD card. But is there enough room to actually have something like that so you can go in the profile and load you know AES or Sega Genesis or something? Uh, yes, on the internal flash, I suppose. Hmm. All right, I'll talk. Uh, I'll talk to you afterwards about that. Maybe we can get some of the ones, some of the more problematic consoles built in, just to make it easier for people. Because, yeah, but, mm -hmm. I, but about the Neo Geo, I think one problem with those that the actual models are a bit different. So it was one or two years ago when I got a chance to test like five different models. So only one of those models had these sync issues where you actually needed those special settings. So. Yeah, that's, that's probably an I've, uh, extreme case, but still. Yes, that's uh, that's something I've I've been digging into. It's each console has so many different variants of models, and including in the Neo Geo ones I've been testing, have some very wild differences between them on the video output side. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, overall, though, I mean, this is uh, I think the reason people are are asking for things like this is because. While this project, when it first started, it felt like a really great way for people who were very technical, who wanted to get in and tweak settings to, to use older consoles on the newer TVs, I think by now, with all the features you've added and with all the amazing updates to it, this really has become more of a standard than the FrameMeister for people to just have one, one step above the, uh, the desire to tinker. So if you just want to plug in your consoles and walk away, you get a frame meister, but as long as people just have that one extra little bit of patience, I really feel like the OSSC is becoming the thing that everybody uses, and I'm very happy. I'm very happy yeah. to see uh, a device that was designed for the community being embraced by the community like this. Yeah, but there's still a lot of room for improving the usability, but, well, if that, if that CPU thing gets, gets sorted out, then hopefully we can make improvements on that sector too. Spoken like a true engineer. You have a great product and your answer is, but there's still room for improvement. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess for now, one of the things that I noticed is, uh, is going to be a huge help for people looking to use the Super Nintendo or the Nintendo is your de-jitter boards. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I just thought that was an amazing idea and I, I was really happy to see uh, somebody working on that. And I'll pull up the um, where is it? I'll pull up the shmups thread now that kind of shows a little bit about this. Yeah, so basically the operating principle is quite simple. So it's, it's explained on the first post. So uh, basically there are like the consoles generate short scan lines like periodically, or in case of uh, NES, it also can depend on the game. So what the board actually does is. Uh, it gets the master clock to compensate for this uh, short scan line, so it's quite simple. But the big challenge with those boards is that it should like be universal for all the revisions and including like potential boards like DFO and everything like that. So that's made, like the bigger challenge. So the way I had, uh, I had interpreted it, um, like when you have. A Super Nintendo plugged into the OSSC, you see a refresh rate that's like 60.0 something. It's not directly 60 hertz. Um, and that's, uh, is that the same basic principle as getting the clocks to output the exact refresh rate? Uh, no, actually it's not related to that, but uh, it's more related to the actual sync signal coming into the OSSC. So. It's like normal sources, you get this periodic sync, but with the SNES, you're like, it varies depending on the scan line. That's not a good thing for any digitizer. Okay. Um, and, and that's basically just conforming the analog signal that used to be pretty wide open for compatibility uh, to the, the strict digital standards, correct? Uh, yeah, well, that, if you think about CRT, you can, like, almost anything to it and it still seems so. But when you are going to digital, the signal goes to a PLL and they are like, they can't 
stand what sitter. And I, I believe the um, the biggest challenge for people who are installing the DJitter board is just that there are so many different revisions of the motherboards, different regions. Um, but overall, you would uh, you would make the board pretty much the same and just uh, have to alter a few components based upon which model or which region. Is that true? Uh, yeah, the actual the most recent version has a couple of jumpers, which can be like just sorted or let open depending on the installation. So, I love that idea. That way, if uh, even if you short the wrong one, you could just, uh, you know, remove the solder and short the different one to, to give that a try, too. It's a great exactly. idea. Yeah, and I tried to make the board as small as possible and, like, as easy to install, but we'll see how that, like, how the feedback goes. And um, uh, did you open source that DJ board, or is that something that's, um, that's uh, just your private design? Well, it's all, yeah, it's open source. It's like on the hundred hundred lines of like very lock, so it's basically nothing. That's the, pretty the logic cool. part. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I I believe I saw Dan um, Citrus three thousand PSI on the forums. I believe I saw a while back he uh, integrated the D jitter board and the RGB mod into one board for a Super Nintendo Mini. Um, I never got a chance to try that yet, but uh, I, I, open source projects allow for very cool things like that to happen. So um, I'll get around to trying that soon, but I think that's a pretty neat idea for people that want to. Yeah, I also put it under MIT license, which is very liberal, so you can actually put the code in a like, completely closed product if you want. So, for example, I was hoping that maybe that code would be integrated into the NES RGB someday, but we'll see. Okay. So basically, if you have an SRCB, at the moment you still need the digital board with your display. Like, you can't cope the signal very well, but uh, in the optimal case, it would be like fixed in the SRCB. That's a great idea, integrating it right into the NES RGB. Um, are there yeah. any negative effects of the digital board? Does it change the speed at all? Is it something that speedrunners might notice? <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to talk about that. So basically, the answer is yes, but it's very negligible. So I calculated that if you uh, play a game for one hour, so you you get basically one frame behind a vanilla console. So it's very little. Yeah, so for anybody that might be listening that doesn't, uh, doesn't really understand this exact problem, um, for your average gamer, and including your average hardcore gamer, you know, uh, competitive gamers, um, people who it's their favorite game and they know it inside and out, um, you could, having something like this or having something like um, the, when Woozle reclocked the Game Boy Advance slightly so that you get a clear picture on the screen, um, that does not affect the gameplay at all. You don't feel a difference. Um, even c- hardcore competitive gamers don't notice a difference. The only time this is an issue is for people who uh, who submit speed runs when it really is essentially a game of milliseconds at times. Uh, I've seen a few of the the top leaderboards be all the same second with the difference in milliseconds. And especially yeah. if you have games that take hours and hours to beat, you know, having having uh, two seconds behind might make a difference. But that is honestly the only use case I could think of at the moment that would ever be affected by any kind of de-jitter mod or clock speed mod in order just um, only from the point of view of making it sync up with newer TVs better. So uh, did, did I get that right? Uh, yeah, basically. Okay. Um, so uh, that actually, um, I'd like to talk about the your CPS2 HDMI project at all because the question I always forgot to ask you is, did you have to change the clock speed on that, or is it just a one-to-one output, um, but HDMI and upscale? Um, you mean not change the clock of CPS2? Yes. Uh, no, I didn't change that. So the basic idea with the new board is that it's standard 1080p timing, but uh, with the exception of lower pixel clock, which basically means the refresh rate is like a bit lower than 60 because of the how the CPS2 is designed. So this is a very exciting product for a few reasons. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people seem to misunderstand the need for being able to use original equipment on flat screen TVs. And I, I very often hear people say, well, why don't you just get a PVM or why don't you just get a CRT? 
Uh, and the two answers to that is they don't make CRTs anymore, so eventually that is just not going to be an option. But also, a lot of people are involved in fighting tournaments, and especially with the CPS2 stuff, because that covers all of the classic Street Fighter games. And it's a lot of work to carry these rare, expensive monitors up a couple of flights of stairs, hook up all your equipment. You know, it takes yeah. up a lot of space. It's very Yeah, heavy. I know what, what you are talking about. I haven't done that myself back in the day, too. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how I messed my backup last year. I was just carrying all those huge monitors up and down the stairs a couple times a week, and eventually my back just said, you're too old for this shit. <laughs> so um, being able to use original hardware on newer TVs, especially some of the newer ones that have zero or near zero lag, means that you could have a, a true fighting game experience in high definition without lugging CRTs and expensive equipment around that's, you know, the CPS2 boards themselves are, are finite as well, but it's a lot easier to protect that and carry it upstairs than, you know, than 10 big RGB monitors. So this is when you first announced this project, I just thought it was a huge deal, and I thought a lot of people were really going to go nuts over this. Um, so uh, I guess, can you talk just a little bit about exactly what it is? Uh, I guess the basic understanding is it's um, an analog to digital converter designed for the CPS2 boards. Well, actually, it's not analog to digital because it taps the digital buses on the CPS, so no conversion needs to be made. So, oh, so that's right. You're tapping the digital bus right out, so you're not actually uh, you're not actually upscaling an analog signal. Yeah. So, so that basically avoids a lot of issues or potential issues. So, is that um, one of the reasons you're able to get such low latency? Is because there's no conversion required? Well, it's not really related to that. You can still get low latency with even if you were digitizing it, but uh, otherwise it just makes things simple and it's already digital. And uh, I imagine there's a very small but a quality difference as well, because um, in my experience, anytime anything is converted to analog and back, there's something. It's me. You know. Yeah, you always always lose something. Mm -hmm. um, now. Uh, is this something that people are able to buy at the moment? Um, actually, I have. Let me let me switch over to um, uh, to that picture now. Actually, sorry. So uh, I have the original post here of your CPS2 board um, and your original demos, but I have the website that you showed me with some of the pictures. So um, in picture one right now, that looks like uh, you're soldering. Um, female adapters on top of the other chips so that you could actually slot the board on. Uh, yeah, maybe I should quickly talk a bit about the background. So the second board is a bit like Optimus version of the first one. And one thing is that I've tried to make the installation a bit easier. So with the first board, you have to set it up somewhere yourself and then get the HDMI, maybe a like extension cable or something like that. But with the new one, it's like quite easier to install. And one thing also is that the plan is to make it compatible with CPS3 as well. Wow, okay. okay. Maybe even some other boards. So I see that you have the slots on the top of the chips and then you put the board right on top of that. So uh, it, essentially, I mean, you're just, once you solder those sockets on, it's a, you just push this right on top of it, right? Yeah, basically. So it's quite easy to solder those sockets on top of the uh, round chips, and then you just add the uh, mod board on top of that and connect everything. I'm just looking through the pictures now. This is all very impressive stuff. I can't wait to, to mess with these in person. Yeah, I actually have almost assembled the first first one. Okay. So I should have some results maybe in one or two weeks. So it, uh, I see you have to cut just a tiny bit of the metal uh, shielding, uh, which is never a big deal in my opinion. Um, and then I'm looking, uh, and it seems like you have to cut just a very, very small bit of the plastic in order to expose the HDMI port. Uh, yeah, what, what metal shielding are you talking about? Um, image 7. Uh, but there's no metal shielding, so you just cut the plastic and that's fine. Okay, I, I thought uh, I, I might have skipped over one. I believe image six had the metal. Is that? Oh no, that's the plastic. Ha, 
It's just uh, yeah. shiny, and I'm looking at it through OBS. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, are you able to do simultaneous HDMI and JAMA output as well? Uh, yeah, of course. That is such a big deal for so many people who do streaming and fighting tournaments, because then you could actually have... Uh, 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 my favorite setup was seeing those head-to-head sit-down cabs. So you could actually have a scenario where two people are playing against each other on all original hardware and then having your HDMI output uh, into a stream to capture it for everybody else. So the people playing are playing in 240p on the original CRTs and everybody watching is enjoying it in high definition. Yeah, the only limitation is that if you want to use the analog output, uh, then you have to keep in mind that the buttons also control the, like, the menus. But I think... We can make some solution for that. For example, you hold down, hold down one button to access the menu, so you don't accidentally like, make any changes if you just want to change the analog volume. Um, I mean, yeah, where you could have a button on the board, or you could just implement the start button uh, as well, because you know, obviously you don't use the start button in gameplay. So, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, but I'm trying to just use the three buttons, or actually two of them, of the like, CPS2, so... It's be like good enough. Very cool. I'm very excited about this. I can't wait to see this in the, some of the fighting tournaments. I know the tournament uh, Too Old, Too Furious is thrilled to have something like this. So uh, I'll definitely be checking out a little more of it. Um, so uh, what are, are what are the things that you have on the horizon that you're able to talk about, of course? I know there's some things, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't want to tell everybody. But is there anything you're working on now that you'd like to mention? Uh, well, probably... I should currently finish this CPS2 thing and also make the SNES digital board like final. So it's pretty much finalized now, but still some small things to do. And and aside from those, there's always some research and ideas going on, but I wouldn't say I have like anything concrete yet. Okay. Um, do you so, do you have any thoughts on uh, on 4K scaling? Um, and this is something that a lot of people scoff at because they say, oh, you don't need to play Super Mario Brothers in 4K. But it's not about that. It's about a lot of TVs um, and even uh, computer monitors that I've tested. Unless you run them in the native resolution, you do get more lag and it doesn't quite look the way it should. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that and any, any potential possibilities of a 4K version of the OSSC or even, I guess, the CPS2 board in the future? Yeah, the 4K is, of course, the next logical step forward, so that's certainly something to think about. So, But currently it's quite uh, expensive to implement, but it's still doable with FPGAs. But maybe in a couple of years it's like more, like more realistic if you want to make some actual product. Mm. I know I just spoke to Zsworks last week, uh, about their 4K upscaling solution, uh, and he went into detail on how difficult it is and how you actually. I'm going to oversimplify this because I'm not. I'm not a Verilog expert. I'm not an FPGA engineer, but I think he basically said you have to utilize uh, pins on the FPGA that aren't really designed to do that in order to get the extra bandwidth out to get 4K 60 or higher. I guess uh, it doesn't. Well, that depends on the FPGA. Uh, with the new ones, you have those transceivers. And you can use those for driving HDMI as well. Oh, okay. Um, are you? Uh, do you have any plans on upscaling digital as well, so that people could put in their digital 480p consoles and have those upscaled to 4K? Well, that's also one like logical step if you were, were doing like a new version of OSC or something like that. So yeah, we're always <laughs> thinking about those things, but. As I said before, there's nothing concrete yet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, uh, I think there's a huge market for an affordable 4K upscaling solution because, uh, I mean, don't forget, there is no reliable gaming 4K upscaler now at all. So that also means people that want to play Xbox 360, um, PlayStation 3, uh, even the Wii U, uh, I mean, there's no way to get that into 4K without using your TV's upscaler. And uh, I spoke to John Linneman from Digital Foundry about this as well. And certain consoles, especially like the PlayStation 3 and the, the Wii U, 
if you run them in 720p mode and then were able to upscale that to 4K, you'd actually get um, maybe a little better performance and a, a definitely a better picture. So that's something everybody's excited about. And I think there's even a small market now that would pay a lot of money for one of those. So. Yeah. One thing to keep, is, keep in mind is still that the TV upscalers, they have got a bit better over the years. So upscaling from 1080p to 4K in many cases doesn't incur any latency penalty. Yeah, and I've noticed, um, I have. Uh, I was lucky enough to find an LG OLED TV on sale for very cheap, uh, and it does an excellent job. I'm very happy with it. But there are other affordable TVs out there, like some of the TCLs in America. I know people have mentioned certain model LG TVs that have excellent panels in them, but terrible electronics. <laughs> so if you run them at native resolution, like uh, my friend got a TCL TV, and we watched something, um, I think it was uh, Netflix, on using the apps that were built in, and then I plugged in my Apple TV 4K, which isn't the greatest 4K upscaler, but it's good, uh, and it was a night and day difference. So while you're, you're definitely right about that, I think um, being able to, to, just, to present a panel like that, a native resolution, would definitely be a help. So. Yeah, it's always better if you can fit the native resolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but in general, I'm not sure about the market, <laughs> because if you think about devices like DVDO, VP, VPs and things like that, they don't really exist yet for 4K. Right. And I'm afraid that the costs are a bit high at the moment for doing those. So it would be nice to see more of those, but unfortunately, there's not that many yet. Correct. Um, well, I mean, I'm trying to just think of anything else to, that I wanted to ask. I mean, we're just... Uh... Yeah, there is one other thing. Um, uh, there's been a lot of people that have been talking about custom panels, and, uh, and especially for any of the fighting tournaments or gaming. Um, have you ever thought of trying to make one of these that goes directly into an LCD panel? Uh, so you, you essentially integrate the features of this so somebody could take an LCD panel and have it be a retro gaming console, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, you're not the first one who suggests something like that. So, yeah, I've had some thoughts. And funnily enough, a couple of months ago, my old LCD monitor broke down. And, well, I tried to replay, uh, like, fix it. But I think the panel is, like, broken and it's beyond repair. But it's not, like, completely dead. So it's, like, half of the picture is missing and things, things like that. But basically that means that I have now one panel which I could use for development if I want. So maybe I should try that at some point. Yeah, I mean, so it's... Uh, basically, you just drive the LVDs into the panel and, yeah, that should do it. But of course, like, getting a bigger system around that is that's not much more challenging. Gotcha. Well, um, was there anything that, uh, that I forgot to mention that you wanted to talk about? Uh, well, I guess that's pretty much it. There was some talk about, or like, uh, let me check. Yeah, you wanted to hear some thoughts about the uh, display technologies and something like that. So, uh, okay, we talked. We talked a bit about panels, and then one thing is the crystal LED. Have you heard about that? I've heard it's about actually, it. I don't yeah, know it was know. actually, I think it was five years ago, this technology demonstrated by Sony, so there's probably some new versions this year, at least what I've heard, so it's quite interesting to see if that's, that's got any progress. So I think the main advantage compared to OLED is basically the thing that it, it doesn't use the organic thing, so I think that's the weakness of the OLED, that O, so basically you it's not like really reliable in case like in the, in the long term. So you can get some retention issues and burnings and things like that. So the, the crystal LED is still lit by a separate lighting as opposed to its own light, correct? Well, it's an emissive technology light, just like all that. Oh, it so is? Okay. It, it's not that different as far as I know, but there's some like, some like clear differences. Interesting. I got to check those out then. I, um, my, my old company that I used to work for, I was able to go to CES every year. So for six years, I was able to see all these things in person the day they were released. 
and uh, I don't I don't do that anymore. So I feel like I'm missing out on a lot of the newer, uh, very fun technologies. <laughs> yeah, so at least I'm interested to see what Sony has come up with that, or if they have at all. Definitely. Now, have you um, have you had a chance to to uh, either watch TV or game on the different types of panels? So LCD, plasma, OLED, um, and then you know some of the the different LED backlit technologies they have. Yeah, of, of course, of course. But do you have a favorite of all of them so far? Uh, well, my favorites are like all, all those self-emissive technologies. So I'm not really big fan of LCD in general, but yeah. Yeah, but I, I understand that there are always many reasons why LCD is good in many cases. So <laughs> yeah, burning and cost, I think, are two very important things that. Uh, you know, I mean, if you can get a very cheap TV that you could uh, you could beat up pretty hard and it still works fine, I think that's always a good thing. Yeah. So basically, personally, I transfer from plasma directly to OLED. So pretty much skip the LCD. <laughs> yeah, I had a an LCD TV in my bedroom, but uh, for years now I've had a plasma TV in my living room, and then I just upgraded to the OLED, and I. I just I feel very lucky to have gotten both times I got incredibly good deals both times I happened to walk into a store and was able to get last year's model for almost half price so yeah. I've been very lucky <laughs> yeah, but for the moment I think all it is like it's like it's at a good price at the moment a couple of years ago it was like very expensive but the prices have come down so I would say it's the well, the first thing to look look for if you want like very good picture quality today Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this again. Um, I hope to, to do it again um, next time you come out with another awesome product. And, uh, you know, I just really appreciate all you've done for the community. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, you hang on because I have a few questions for you in a minute. And uh, I will see everybody else in next week's podcast.